Yeah, so we're going to be going through some text analysis stuff in this workshop. I set up a Google Colab notebook. So basically, this lets you write and run code online. Um, so it was in the information associated with the workshop. But if you don't have that with you now, I'm just going to send the link in the chat so that people can go to it so you can follow along and like type along as we're going. Um, so yeah, I'll share my screen, I guess. So basically, um, the idea is we're going to be working with a couple of data sets. Um, one of these data sets contains plot summaries about films that were collected from Wikipedia. And then the other data set contains metadata about those films. And so metadata is things like title, the year it was released, languages that the film contains, that sort of stuff. Um, so we're just going to explore both these data sets um, and we'll be using Python to do that. Um, can I get an idea of like how many people have used Python before or you can like give me a thumbs up reaction or cool. Okay. Uh, yeah. Nice. Okay. So I'll try to go through it kind of slowly and you can just type exactly what I'm typing. So you can like run it yourself. Um, and if you get stuck, you can ask questions in the chat or just shout it out um, if you're having problems. Um, so the way that Google notebooks work is basically you create a, okay. You can create a cell and you click this like plus code button, you type in whatever you want. Um, so this is just gonna print the text, hello. And then to run it, you just click on this little like run button. Yeah, that's me. Okay, and then um, it will run the code and produce output. Um, so before we get started, I thought, um, I'm going to be using breakout rooms a bit um, later on. So just so everyone can introduce themselves to each other and get used to the breakout rooms. Um, I was going to set those up now. Um, how many people? We have eight people. So let's do that. Um, right. So you should have an option to go to the breakout room now for this one. Uh, I was just going to ask you guys to introduce yourselves to each other, maybe who you are, what course you're doing, and what your favorite movie is. And then you can come back um, in about five minutes to the main room and we'll, we'll start going through the workshop. So, so I'm sorry, can I just ask, you know, when you're uh, going to be going through the code to talk, to write in, do you write that into the notebook somewhere or is it into um, like Python itself? Um, right, so what I'm writing the code into um, is the notebook mm -hmm. and the notebook can basically um, run that code then. So, oh, perfect. Okay. This, so they just, everyone just needs the notebook. Yeah, exactly. That's all you need. Um, okay. So you just need a browser to, to run this, which is why it's pretty great. That's, that's really cool. Okay. Okay, cool. I'm going to close the rooms. Um, okay. We're just waiting. Cool. Everyone's back, I think. Um, great. So yeah, let's get started. And um, does everyone have the notebook up on their own screens? Um, can type in chat or yeah, cool. Perfect. Okay. 
So in order to actually download the data sets, um, you just need to run this cell here. So this download data cell, um, if you click the play button on the left hand side, it's going to run, print out a lot of ugly text um, and download the data to the notebook, basically. So it's not downloading it to your computer. It's just downloading it so you can access it with the Python code in this notebook. Um, so once that's finished running, we can do some more boilerplate stuff. So these are all Python libraries um, and we're just importing them into the notebook um, so we can use them later on. Basically, a library is like a bunch of code someone else has written uh, that we can then reuse. So um, this is a bunch of stuff that if we had to write it all ourselves, it would probably take a while and be pretty boring. So instead, we're going to be using these libraries uh, in order to actually do the text analysis. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to run all three of those cells. And then we're finally getting to the actual code for working with the data. So we're using uh, one of these libraries, the pandas library, to load the data set from a CSV file into something we can actually use with Python. Um, so what this does is it creates what's called a data frame called plot summaries. So this is what we've called it here, plot summaries. Um, and then this is reading it from our CSV file. Um, if you've ever used Excel or Google Sheets before, uh, you can think of a data frame like a table, like an Excel spreadsheet. Um, a data frame basically contains rows and columns, and it lets you access that data either through the rows or you can access like a column of data at a time. Um, so it's just handy for interacting with it um, and yeah, manipulating it later on. So the first one here is loading the plot summaries. And then this second cell is loading the metadata. So the movie titles and other associated information. Um, is everyone able to run that stuff OK? Um, any issues or? Cool. Um, so we're going to start actually looking at the data. So um, I briefly told you what the data set was, but um, it's actually from a, I got it, I didn't create it myself. It's downloaded from uh, this website um, and they actually have an explanation of what the data set contains. So if you're interested like to go to the source and see what the data is, um, you can go here. Um, but we'll just actually look at what we have in the notebook. So this first cell here, metadata.dtype. So metadata is what we called our data frame that contains the movie data, right? And then D type stands for data types. So this will basically show us for each column in our data frame, what type of data it contains. So we can see on the left-hand side here, we have our column names. Uh, so there's one called wiki ID, one called freebase ID, one called name. Um, and on the right-hand side, it says what type of data these contain. So Wiki ID is an int, which means it's an integer, which basically is a number. Um, object is kind of a generic term, but in uh, this case, it usually means it's a piece of text. So it's a string of text. Um, so, and a float is a decimal point number. So box office is a float, that makes sense because it's money. Um, Release date is a integer, um, which uh, we can have a look at it and see what that is because a date wouldn't normally be an integer. So if we do metadata release date, so this is how we look at the column called release date. Um, and we can run that. 
Okay, so release date is the year that the movie was released rather than the day it was released. Um, so you can do the same thing for the other data frame. Um, so it's called plot summaries, and we have autocomplete there. The types. And this one only has two columns. It has the wiki ID, which I assume is the same as the wiki ID up here. And um, so between the two data sets, they have an ID that will allow you to match the rows. Um, and it has a summary, which is what it contains. So that makes sense. Um, so yeah, um, some more ways of accessing some information here. So if you want to see how many rows there are in the data frame, um, you can look at the shape of the data frame. So if we run this, it will tell us that there are 40,000 rows and two columns, which matches up with what we saw here. Um, and then if we're looking at the um, wiki ID in the plot summaries, you can just have a look at it like this. And um, this is the same as accessing it this way. Um, it's just some number that identifies the film. So um, not very meaningful, but if you want to know how many different wiki IDs there are, we can use this and unique, um, which basically looks at the whole column and counts the number of unique entries in that column. So we can see there's the same number of unique entries in that column as there are rows. So each row has a different wiki ID, which is great because it wouldn't really make sense if we had rows that had the same ID in this case. Um, so yeah, uh, if you want to go ahead and have a look at the same for the metadata, I'll type it out on my end and you guys can follow along as well. Um, so metadata shape. Cool. So this is great news because it means there shouldn't be any duplicate data in either of our data frames. Um, often with real world data sets, that's something you have to deal with. Um, but this time it looks like each row should be a different film and it should be uh, a unique film. So if we wanna have a look at a specific row in the data frame, um, can anyone suggest a movie that we could look at? Um, this data set doesn't contain every movie, but it contains a lot. So if you suggest a movie name, there's a high chance that will be in the data set. You can pop it in chat or just uh, say it or whatever. Inception, cool, okay, yeah, let's have a look for that. So one thing when you're working with code um, and data, you often have to be really careful because things are case sensitive. So when we're typing in Inception here, I'm pretty sure this is how you spell it, pretty sure it starts with a capital I, in the data set. Um, but if you're looking for anything else, just be aware of that it needs to be exactly right in order for the code to be able to find it. Um, so let's have a look. Yeah, perfect. So we have the movie Inception, came out in 2010. That sounds about right. Um, box office is kind of hard to parse, but looks like 825 million. Uh, I'm not sure what currency that's in, but probably dollars. Um, so yeah, and you'll notice as well that if we're looking at the languages, countries, and genres, these are lists rather than single values. So that's something to be aware of when we're dealing with the data later on. Uh, we're probably gonna have to do something in order to manipulate the list rather than just accessing a piece of text. Cool. 
Um, so yeah, I'm gonna put you guys back in breakout rooms um, and why don't you just have a look at the data sets um, and see what you can find. Like maybe you can find something interesting um, and you can just look up whatever movie you want or if you wanna look up something based on index rather than searching for something that matches a name you're able to access it like this. So this is the index here on the left hand side. Um, you see it doesn't have a column title, it's just the index. So if we take this number and we use this dot lock format, we can access the same data based on ID rather than looking for the name. So yeah, I will open up the breakout rooms again. I'm gonna set them up for like 10 minutes. Um, and then I'll ask you guys to come back. Um, I might actually change the rooms. Yeah, I'll, I'll see how it goes. Okay, cool. I think everyone's back. Uh, Cool, okay, I'm just having a look at the chat. Oh, sure, so um, why we're using converters when we're loading the data. Um, so up here, um, we're loading the metadata and we have this thing here called converters. Um, and the reason we're using those is because in the CSV, um, languages, countries, and genres are all lists of text, um, but when, this function is um, being used, it doesn't know that they're supposed to be lists. It just thinks they're strings of text that start with a bracket and end with a bracket. Um, so this is just to turn them from strings of text into actual Python lists. So if we look at the languages data down here, you can see it's a list. And then if we actually access languages, it's it's a Python list, so we can access each element of the list separately. Um, it's just so it's easier to work with uh, when we're actually looking at the data now. Um, cool. So does anyone want to share what they found? What movies you were looking at? Anything interesting you saw? Um, we noticed that uh, some of like the newer movies weren't in the um, data set, but uh, some of the older ones were. So it was like it's like the really new ones weren't really there. Right. So what kind of movies were you looking for? When did they come out? Um, well, we did a range. So we started by watch like looking for some that are currently in the cinema, and then uh, maybe some from twenty nineteen or twenty twenty. Um, but most of the ones that were before 2016 were, were there. Cool. Yeah, no, that's a really good idea. Like when are these movies actually from? And if we look at the release date data frame, we can actually find out what the largest year in the data set is. Um, so this max function here will just give us the biggest number in this column. Um, and it's 2016. So this data set, I think, was released in 2013. Um, so I think it has some movies um, in it from after that because there might have been like pre-release -re pre information about them on Wikipedia or something. Um, but the majority of the movies it contains are gonna be like pre-2013. Did anyone else uh, notice anything when they were looking at the data? Uh, cool. Okay. Some movies have multiple release dates, so they appeared a few times. Yeah, that's true. I think the first movie I noticed that for was actually Titanic. There are apparently multiple movies called Titanic. Um, so that was interesting for me because I only knew about the 1997 one. Um, 
but yeah, you can't rely on the movie title being unique because there are lots of movies and there are remakes and yeah, it could very well appear multiple times in the data set. Cool. Okay, so I think next what we're going to do is we're going to dig into one of the columns in particular. Um, so this function here, um, I probably won't explain it in detail, but basically what it does is it takes our whole data frame here, the metadata data frame, it takes a column name, and then it returns a new data frame that just contains the data from that column expanded out into its own data frame. So the reason we're doing that is because some of these columns are lists and it's kind of difficult to work with lists inside a data frame. So instead of working with them like that, we're just gonna turn them into their own data frame and then we'll have a look at them. Um, so you need to run this so it actually loads the function and then we can create our genre data frame, which is just going to contain all the data from this. And so I'm not sure if we can hear you at the moment. Oh, um, can you hear me now? Or is it still quiet? OK, cool. Oh, that might just be me. <laughs> no worries. Thanks for letting me know. Um, cool. So yeah, we're just going to run this list into data frame function. Um, and then create this genre data frame in this column here. Okay, so we can start by looking at this genre data frame. So it should have the same number of rows as the metadata data frame because um, it's just turning each row here um, into like a set of columns. Um, in a new data frame. So it has, yeah, the same number of rows, 73,000, but it has 362 columns. So this means that the number of unique types of genres in our original data set is 362. So that's definitely more than I was expecting. I'm not sure I could name what all of those genres would be. Um, but we can have a look at um, what the most common genres are. So we saw up here that each film has more than one genre attached to it. Um, so uh, there's probably um, some genres that are fairly specific. Um, well, this is Titanic, so yeah, disaster shows up in all three of these. Um, but some of them are probably pretty general genres and they'll show up in lots of movies. So we want to see which are the most common. Um, what we can do is we can uh, sum, uh, well, I should probably, we should probably just look at what this looks like first. So let's just look at a single row of this data frame and see what it contains. So this is one row of the data frame. So this is for one film. There are 362 columns, so it's obviously very long. But you can see that the actual data here on the right-hand side is just zero or one for each of these columns. So basically, all this data frame is, um, is for each movie, it has a one in any column that um, has a genre that that movie belongs to, and a zero in any column that the genre doesn't match the movie. Um, so in order to figure out what the popular genres are, what we can do is we can sum um, all of the values across the columns. I think this should work. So this is just going to take each column, add up all the values in the column. And if there's a one in a row, that means that movie belongs to that genre. So by adding them up, we find out how many movies belong to that genre. Oh, wrong one, should be. Yeah. Um, so let's sort this list. Um, 
Uh, so that's sorting from least to most. So we want to do ascending equals false. And then we don't really want to like scroll through the whole list. So we're just going to do the first 10. So from the first element of the list to the 10th element of the list. Cool. OK. So the most common genre is drama. Um, second most common is comedy. So yeah, I mean, those, those seem like pretty broad categories that a lot of films fall into. Um, if we want to find out which genres are the least common, we can do basically the same thing, except we do want it to go from smallest to largest number. So we want ascending equals true. So yeah. Uh, well, OK, so this is interesting. There's actually a misspelling of comedy as one of the genres. So that only occurs once in the data set. But yeah. There, there are going to be probably some issues um, with data cleanliness in this data set because I think all the data comes from um, not just Wikipedia, but there was like an open database of information. So presumably the uh, info was entered into that database by a large number of different people, and there's always going to be errors with data entry. So um yeah and then more of these kind of aggregate functions so we've used some here twice um but if we want to find the proportion of um films in each genre um we can find the average the mean average um, instead of the sum that. So yeah, like a very, very large proportion of these movies are classified as drama movies, 42%. Um, and then if we want to find out how many genres each movie has, so like, for example, if we look at Titanic here, there's like, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, nine different genres um, it classified us. So that would be uh, we want to sum across the rows rather than the columns. So Um, this should value counts. So instead of sorting all of these values, we actually want to know like this is movie zero and it has seven genres. So we want to count how many movies have seven genres. So that's why we're using value counts. So yeah, we can kind of see there's some movies that have zero genres apparently. Um, there is actually probably quite a large number that only have one genre associated with them. And there's sort of, you can almost actually sort of see like this dis distribution here, um, kind of higher on the smaller end of genres, but there's a long tail of movies that have a lot of genres associated with them. There's actually one movie that has 17 genres. Um, so, if we want to figure out what movie that is, we can do that. Um, so if we do metadata, genres, and then we want to apply a function just to this column. Um, that equals 17 for one movie. And then we want to access that one movie. So apparently young Sherlock Holmes has 17 different genres um, from 1985. So yeah, it's a good way to find movies you've never heard of. 
Um, so if you want to find out on average, how many genres does a movie have? We can take our value counts here. Um, we don't actually need the value counts. We just need to sum across. And we take the average. So on average, each movie has the mean average of the number of genres of each movie is around three. Um, if you want to actually look at the distribution plotted in a graph, um, we can use this library called Seaborn. So on the x-axis, we want to plot the number of genres. So if we go back up here, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, those are the number of genres belonging to a movie. Um, so we can access that data by getting the index of this. And then on the y-axis, we want to plot how many movies have that number of genres. So that's the values. Um, that should work. Yeah, so you can almost actually sort of see this distribution here as well um, with the way the, the numbers increase. But it's a lot clearer when you see it plotted out like this. Like most of the movies don't actually have that many genres associated with them, but there is this long tail we see here. Um, does anyone have any questions? Okay, um, I think because we're almost at 7 p.m. Um, and we're, we've got another hour, might take a break now for about 10 minutes. Um, and then when we get back, we can dive into some more um, data analysis and some more plotting stuff. Um, does that sound good? That sounds great. That sounds good. Cool. Okay, so back here in 10 minutes and I'll pause the recording for now. Perfect. Okay, is everyone back? Just thumbs up or put something in chat. Cool, perfect. Okay, so what we were going to look at next um, was instead of looking at the genres as this whole list, um, we can dig down and look at one genre in particular. Um, so for this, um, I just arbitrarily selected one of the genres. Um, so we're going to create this series. So basically like a new column. Um, that is going to be true if the film is a romance film um, and false if the film is not a romance film. So in order to do that, um, we can use our genre DF. So each row of the genre DF corresponds to a row in the metadata data frame. So that's where we're able to, sorry about that. Um, that's where we're able to like use the, like if you remember here, Oh, well, I use the metadata genres thing, but um, if we know row zero in the genre DF is a romance film, then that means row zero in the metadata data frame is also a romance film. So we can just use this genre DF, um, and then we're gonna select the column that corresponds to the genre we care about. Um, so if we look at that column, Remember, it's just a list of zeros and ones. Um, so we're gonna 
apply a function to this column. Um, and that function is going to return true if the value is one. But otherwise, it's going to return false. Um, so we'll do that. And then if we look at our new column, you can see for each zero up here, the value here is false. Um, and the reason why we want this true false column is it makes it a bit easier to access the data in metadata. So if we want to only look, for example, at films that are romance films, we can just use this is romance column to access each row in metadata. So what this will do, this is a list of true and false values. So for each row that's false, it will just discard it. And for each row that's true, it will keep it. So when we run this, we'll just see a subset of the metadata data frame. So there are 9,557 rows that are romance films. So that's how many romance films are in the data set. Um, and we can see here just a subset of the titles. Um, so I don't particularly recognize any of these. Um, some of them are pretty old. This is one from the 1930s. Um, some of them are from uh, other countries, um, cinema industries. So for example, there's a couple of Indian films here. Um, so yeah, that's subset. Um, I'm trying to think, I don't know if I can think of any uh, films offhand that I would call a romance film to check if they're in the data set. Does anyone have any ideas or? I'm Harry met Sally. Cool. Never actually seen it, but I've heard it's great. So hopefully this is the correct capitalization. Uh, well, that's not going to do anything, obviously. So metadata dot name equals one Harry met Sally. Okay. Uh, it doesn't look like it's there. It could be that I'm typing the title wrong. Um, or it could be that it's not in the data set at all. The notebook. Okay, let's try that. Cool, okay, that's there. So if you wanna check if it's in our romance subset, you can do metadata is romance, and then we'll just look for the notebook in particular. Awesome. So. Our subset does include this film that we expected to be in there. And we can see in its genres column, we have romance film as well. So it's working as expected. Um, so we wanna figure out what proportion of films are classified as romance film. Um, we already saw that there's about like 9,000 rows um, in the romance film subset, but we can also do this again film and then just take the mean across that column. So 13% of the movies in this data database are classified as romance film. So not as many as the dramas, but that's still a sizable proportion. Um, so this is one uh, that might be interesting to look at. How has the proportion of films that are romance film changed over time? Um, so there's a couple of different ways you could try and approach this, but given what we've already constructed, we can take a subset um, and then have a look at the number of films that were uh, released each year that were romance films. Uh, 
I mistyped metadata. That's great. Cool. Um, did I do something? Oh, okay. Yeah. No, this looks right. So in 1978, there were 67 romance films, apparently. Um, and then if we assign this to another column, and then we do the same thing just for like all movies, because presumably the number of movies released each year increased as time went on. So uh, we want to uh, probably want sort equals false so that it's ordered by the year rather than by the number of movies. And then if we do romance counts divided by the counts, I think this should work. Yeah. So 11% of the movies. Uh, we'll go to the top. Okay, so there is kind of a messy data set as we saw already. Um, there are apparently is a movie in here from 1010, which seems just like a mistake. Um, there could be some very short experimental stuff from early on, I guess, but I'm not really sure what would be here. So we can just kind of ignore this early set of years. Um, and have a look maybe at the 1950s. So around 12% of the movies released in 1953 were romance films apparently. And um, there's actually a dip here in the 70s. And then we're back to around 12 in the 90s. And it looks like there's a bit of an increase here as we go towards the 2000s. So it's not super easy to kind of evaluate this data just as a list of numbers. So we're going to do the same thing we did before and turn it into a graph because that's a bit easier to parse. So the index is going to be our x axis. And the values are going to be our y axis. And we're going to put it all into a bar plot. I didn't make any syntax mistakes. Cool. Okay. So it is a tiny bit of a mess because there's basically too many labels on our x axis, so it's impossible to read what the year is, but if we just ignore that and kind of look at it as a trend over time, um, we can kind of see these peaks um, and, and drops in the proportion of movies overall that were romance films over time. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm gonna do the same thing again. Um, put you all in breakout rooms and you can choose a different genre to explore or you can dig into this one a bit more um, and then after five ten minutes uh, we'll come back and we'll move on to actually looking at the text in the summaries and doing some analysis of that okay cool I think we're all back um I decided to try and look for When Harry Met Sally um, by using this. It's a string function in Python, um, and you can basically match the start of a piece of text with whatever you're looking for. So turns out it was in the data set. Um, it just ends with three periods. So that's why we couldn't find it. Um, what genres did everyone have a look at? Uh, we looked into the comedy genre, so we, we kind of followed the same process uh, just for comedy movies. Okay. And were there many at the start of the timeline or 
where they kind of uh, yeah there was quite an, an early peak and then a drop and then it kind of um evened out a little bit more Did anyone explore anything else? Okay. Um, yeah, so the next part, um, I was thinking we would actually look at the plot summaries, which we haven't really looked at at all so far. Um, so these are plot summaries taken from Wikipedia. Um, and you might remember that the metadata data set had a column called wiki ID and the plot summary data set also had a com uh, column called wiki ID. So the assumption would be that these are the same sort of ID um, and we'll be able to match the plot summary to a movie based on the wiki ID. Um, so let's just check and see if uh, that assumption is correct, if there are actually overlaps between the IDs in these two different data sets. So this um, line here, it accesses, I should probably use consistent syntax, be easier to follow. Um, so this accesses the wiki ID column in metadata, and it asks for each row in this column, is that value in whatever this set is. So in this case, we're asking for each row in the metadata wiki ID column, is that value also in the plot summaries wiki ID column? So we can see that there's some of them are, some of them aren't. Um, so if we sum up this whole line, we can see how many of the metadata rows are also in the plot summary data set. So there's around 37,000 rows in metadata that are also in the plot summary data set. So if you remember from the start, plot summaries had 40,000 rows. So this means that there are rows in plot summaries that don't have a corresponding row in metadata. And there are also rows in metadata that don't have a corresponding row in plot summaries. So the two data sets are complementary, but they aren't exactly equivalent, if that makes sense. Um, so if we wanna create a data set we can actually use, um, if we need to access information from both data sets, we kind of wanna just find the intersection of the two data sets and then we'll work with that. Um, so you can do that. There's a handy function uh, for data frames that's just called merge. Um, so we'll use that in order to create our new subset. So we'll call this something join df. Um, and we just want this data frame to contain the rows that are in both data sets. So we'll create a subset of metadata using this true false column we've created. So joint data frame should have only the rows that are in both of the data sets. And then we wanna actually merge the data frames now. So Called merge, um, and we want to merge it with plot summaries. And the way we can tell which rows should match is with the wiki ID column. So we're merging it on the wiki ID column. Um, so if we look at this data frame, we can see it has all of the data that appears in the metadata data frame. Let me scroll up. Um, 
it has the title, it has the release date, all of that stuff. But also we have this column over here called summary that just contains a long piece of text that we got from the plot summaries data frame. Um, so now we have it all in one place um, and it'll be easier to, to access the information we need. Um, I'm just gonna delete this because it's taking up a lot of screen space. Okay, so when you're dealing with text, um, it's a bit less straightforward than numbers because there aren't a lot of convenient ways to kind of analyze it. I mean, you can read it, you can look directly at like individual samples, but if you're trying to look at summary information about um, a number of pieces of text, uh, it's, it's a bit less obvious what you can do. So one of the first things you can do is instead of treating it as just one long piece of text, you can split it into words um, and then you can try and analyze things like which words show up most frequently or like which combinations of words occur very often. Um, so to start with, we just need to manipulate our data so it's in a format we can use. So at the moment it's in for each summary, for each uh, film plot, it's in one long string of text and we wanna break that up into a list of words. Um, so to start with, um, we are actually gonna join all of the summaries into one piece of text because we're not interested in the moment in um, like individual plot summaries. We care about like how often do certain words appear in plot summaries or things like that. So we're just gonna join it all into one long piece of text. So in Python, um, when you're joining text, this string here is empty. Um, actually, it should have a space in it. So each piece of text um, inside these brackets is going to be joined together by this text here on the left. So we're going to take each plot summary, put a space, and then put another plot summary after it. So it's just one really long string of text. And then this bit at the end here, uh, dot lower, this is just gonna turn it all into lowercase. So it's gonna remove any capital characters from the, the text. So this is actually my, my Yeah, uh, I'm surprised that didn't print it out, actually. So this is our um, summary. And then if we want to have a look at that, we probably don't want to print the whole thing because um, it's going to be very long. This prints the first 20 characters in the, the string. So that looks okay. Um, and then we have this really long string of text and we wanna turn it into a list of individual words. So this is called tokenization um, and there's lots of different ways you can do it. Um, but with English, kind of the simplest approach to tokenization is just saying every time there's a space, split it because usually words in English are separated by spaces. So there's some edge cases where this isn't true. Like maybe there's gonna be a full stop at the end of some words and that's just gonna remain attached. And, um, but we can deal with that later. So for the moment, um, we can create our list of words by just splitting our long summary by spaces. Okay, and then if we look at how long this actually is, so the length of our list of words, there's 11 million words in total. Okay, and then if we wanna actually count how often each word occurs, 
Um, you could go through the list yourself, like you can do a for loop and like manually create a dictionary um, and like count up how many times you see the word. Um, but there is actually a handy um, piece of a library that will kind of count everything in a list for you. So we're going to use that. Um, so we'll call it word counter, equal counter. And then you pass it in your list of words. Um, and then it will let you see the most common words that occur in the list. So let's look at the 10 most common words. Okay, um, this is probably relatively predictable, but the most common word is the, and all of these words pretty much are like prepositions and pronouns and things like that. So not words that maybe provide a lot of meaning in terms of like what happens in the plots, but obviously these are very frequent words because they're used a lot and they join things together. Um, so if we wanna look at lists of words that are more relevant or we find more interesting, um, we can go through and remove words from our list of words that we don't really care about. Um, so for example, if you wanna remove um, some list of words, you can call it remove words. I want to remove the and to and and. And then we create our new list of words. And we say, we want every word, a word in list of words. If our word is not in remove. So this bit means that if a word in our list is in this list, uh, it's not going to add it to our new list of words. Um, so then we can just repeat this whole thing. And... Oh yeah. Uh, this is not syntactically correct, by them. So just if word not in remove words. Okay, so we still kind of have the same problem here because I removed some of the most frequent uninteresting words, um, but there's still a lot of words that occur very frequently, but aren't very indicative of meaning. Um, so what we can do is, this problem is very common. Um, so there are lists of words that other people have created. And they're usually called stop words. Um, they're words that um, are part of language, but if you just want to look at like nouns and unusual words, um, these stop words are kind of annoying. So there's a data set of stop words and we want the English ones. Um, and then we can use this as our remove words list. So for example, yeah. So like words like I, me, like prepositions, that sort of thing. Um, so if we just take this and instead of creating our own custom list, we can just use this list from somewhere else and then have a look at the word frequency. This is taking a while because um, 
yeah, it has to loop over every word in the 11 million words. So it's a bit slow. Okay, so this is like a bit more interesting. Um, there's still some problems here. Like you can see the most frequent thing here is this, which looks like an empty string. It might be a space of some sort. And also this comma. Um, so we can go through and clean it up some more. Um, we can use this thing. So this basically, same way as we have this list of stop words or lists of words we don't care about. Um, this will create a list of all of the um, punctuation that exists. Um, and then we can just go through and remove the punctuation from the string as well. So I'm going to copy this because we still want to remove the stop words. Um, and then the way we can use this punctuation table um, is this string function called translate. Um, so we're basically saying if there is any punctuation in this word, replace it with an empty string. So we just want to basically, so this like him and then this full stop here. This function uh, will just remove the full stop at the end of him. Um, so I'm going to run this and this. Okay. Um, still not 100% what that is. I'm going to add it to our list of stop words. Um, but you can see here words are starting to get kind of more interesting. We have father here, which apparently is, is very frequent. Um, there's still some things that like maybe if I was going through this myself, I might manually add to the stop word list. Like I can see reasons why you might be interested in like how often numbers occur in summaries. But at the moment, I don't find like the fact that one is the most common word particularly telling or interesting. So I might like remove all numbers or something like that from, from the words as well. Um, yeah, so uh, I added the empty string to the stop word list. So if we run this again, we'll remove that. So there's one more thing that you can do if you're looking to clean some text data um, and it's called lemmatizing which I'm not actually sure where that word comes from. But basically, um, the idea is when it comes to words you use in natural language, there are some words that appear in multiple forms, but they have essentially the same meaning. Um, it depends, obviously, what you're looking for. But in our case, again, we're just looking at lists of words, and we're kind of interested in the broad meaning of the word. Um, so. An example here, um, this is the lemmatizer, I'm just going to load it, um, is a word like talking. Um, semantically, that conveys a lot of the same meaning as other words like talk or talked or any sort of form of that verb. But when you're counting things with the computer, um, it's not capable of recognizing that these are all like variations on the same uh, same word. So what we can do is we can use a lemmatizer to transform all of the words into kind of their stem form. And um, so, oh, uh, well, I can try. So it's not perfect. Um, it's still like a computer algorithm. I thought that would work. Uh, walking. Oh, maybe walks. Um, yeah, okay. So it will turn like plurals into singular form words. And um, for some verbs, it will turn them into like the stem form of the word. Um, and that way we can maybe get a more accurate count of um, which words are appearing in these summaries. So we can do the same thing again and iterate over 
all of our words. Um, so we have this word list here that we've already like cleaned and removed the stop words from. So all this lemmatized words. So we want to apply lemmatizer to each word or word in new list of words. Okay. So I don't know how long this will take, but we'll run it and then we can have a look again at our counter. So we want to look at the words. I'll just wait for that to run. Cool. Um, oh, I didn't remove the empty string. Let's just fix that. Um, if word not in remove words and word is not equal. An empty string. Okay. Um, yeah, but you can see removing, lemmatizing all the words has actually bumped up some of the words. So if words like get, like you could see why that would appear in multiple different formats in the summaries, getting, got, whatever. Um, but once you like, condense all of those into one form of the word, it does actually shoot up the list in terms of how frequently it appears. Um, I'm just gonna rerun this uh, so we can remove that empty string from the top list. Okay, um, and then next we're gonna do the same thing we were doing before. Um, we're gonna plot this to maybe get a more visual sense of like, how much more frequent is the most frequent word versus the least frequent word. Um, so I can put you guys in breakout rooms to do that. And um, if you need help with any of that, you can, um, I think there's a button to like request help and then I can come into the breakout room and give you a hand. Um, but uh, yeah, you can give it a go yourselves. Does anyone have any questions before I open the breakout rooms? Okay. Um, cool. So is anyone able to get the bar plot of the word frequencies? Uh, I can go through how I would do it um, and then we can have a look at what it looks like. Uh, we've got five more minutes, it looks like, okay. Um, so same thing as before. Um, we want, want to use the Seaborn bar plot. Um, our X is going to be the words. Um, so this would be let's see, we have our word counter. Okay, I'm gonna actually change this first. So I'm gonna turn this into a Python dictionary instead of a list of tuples. Um, and then I can access all of the words by looking for the dictionary keys. And then Y is going to be the frequencies. So that's the dictionary values. So hopefully this works. Um, oh. Let me 
just check. Yeah, that looks right. And then And maybe I should turn this into a list. Oh, and actually, we probably don't want all of the keys and all of the values. We just want, let's say, the, the first 10. Cool. OK, so yeah, we have our um, count on the left, so how frequently this word occurs in our data set, and then the words on the bottom. Um, and we can have a look at more than just 10. Um, yeah, well, again, the labels are kind of hard to read. We can just change the rotation. Um, and I forgot the equals. Okay, change the rotation, and then this should hopefully be more legible. Yeah. Um, so we can see there is kind of a sharp drop off at one point, and then they kind of equalize again. Um, we're almost out of time, so I think I was a bit ambitious, and we probably won't get to do the naive phase classifier. But I'll point you to some of the resources um, at the bottom that actually explain this whole naive phase classifier pretty well. So if you're interested and you want to look at this um, afterwards on your own time, um, I'll show you the things that you can read that will kind of like walk you through how it works. Um, just before we go, um, I don't know if any of you remember uh, this type of visualization called a word cloud. Um, but I remember on websites, it used to be pretty popular for things like tags and visualizing like how common certain words were. So we can do that as well. This piece of code here basically just uses the library to do it for you. And you just need to give it this dictionary that has the words and the frequencies. So, so um, you can run that and just have a look at what it looks like. So yeah. Um, yeah, so it's eight o'clock. Um, so at the bottom here, I just have a bunch of links to online tutorials, online documentation. So if you're interested in any of this stuff, um, these are good resources for learning more about it. Um, so the naive Bayes classifier um, is based on this thing from probability called Bayes theorem. And this video here is a really good explanation of what Bayes' theorem is. Um, and then an explanation of the naive Bayes classifier um, is actually available here, the speech and language processing chapter on naive Bayes. Um, this is a really good book um, and it goes through explaining how this algorithm works. Um, so yeah, I'll leave you guys with that. Um, if you have any follow-up questions or something you couldn't get to work in this workshop and you want to know how to fix it, um, I've linked a question form here, so you can send me questions through that. Um, is there anything else before we go? Um, no problem. Hope you enjoyed it and it was useful somewhat.